Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming in with us today. Uh, this is sort of the second round of panels that we are having here at the Insights 2022 conference, uh, treating care workers as essential and not invisible. So I appreciate you coming in. And um, this panel, as you might have uh, seen on the agenda, is called Supporting Healthcare and Elder Care Providers Across a Challenging Ecosystem. And I invite those in the audience to uh, engage with others on the platform within Cadence. We will also have a, a question and answer session commencing at about 2.45. Uh, but without further ado, we're going to get into introductions for the panelists. My name is David Schaefer. I'm the Research Director here at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Next, we have Becky Kurtz, who is the Manager of Aging and Health Resources Division at the Atlanta Regional Commission. Then we have Natasha Taylor uh, of Georgia Watch, where she is the Director of Policy and Access. And we have Shelly Simmons, who is the Executive Director, Director of the Statewide Independent Living Council. So I appreciate the three of you uh, being here today to um, you know, really talk through uh, some of these really uh, challenging issues that we are seeing. Obviously, there's another panel at the same time sort of addressing the pre-K and the childcare side of, of the ecosystem, but this one is specifically focused on uh, what healthcare and elder care and other aspects of the health caring ecosystem look like. So I appreciate each of you being here today. I was going to bring up a couple of statistics that I think are very informative for the purpose of this panel, as well as uh, some of the subsequent things that you're going to see at Insights. And that is uh, something that Ife Finch Floyd brought up early on in the conference. And that is the number of individuals of color who work within the caring ecosystem and the number of women who work in the caring ecosystem. And uh, just some sort of brief overview, we're talking 93% female of those who work in the caring ecosystem on the healthcare side. And we're also talking 66% people of color. And this is the average across home care, nursing homes, and residential care homes. So as we talk about this caring ecosystem, we're talking about an ecosystem that has a lot of implications for uh, racial equity as well as for gender equity. So these are some of the dynamics. And I just wanted to sort of start out with that. And Becky, the first set of questions uh, are really for you. And also just to ask you, if you would, to kind of set the landscape a little bit, since I think you've really got a sense of uh, these different buckets that we're talking about, whether it's nursing care or home care. Can you sort of do a lay of the land for us? And then we'll go into some of the other uh, inquiries that we have about what this looks like. Sure, and happy to be with you in GBPI today for this session. So um, the first thing I wanted to say is that when we talk about health care and elder care or services for individuals with disabilities, we're sometimes talking apples and oranges we might be talking several ecosystems. So I wanna make sure that we're clear on what we're talking about. Um, you think healthcare, a lot of times you think hospitals and clinics and things that your health insurance pays for, right? Uh, the clinical care side of it. But a lot of times what we're talking about and, and the statistics you gave David around the, the direct care workforce actually focus on what we sometimes call the long-term services and supports ecosystem, LTSS. That service is sometimes not even considered healthcare. So let me just uh, pull apart a little bit about those uh, settings. Where does this happen and what are we talking about? What we're talking about, um, when we're talking about, uh, I'll specifically talk about elder care since that's um, a lot of the work that I do. We're talking about assistance with what's sometimes called ADLs, activities of daily living. We're talking about getting help with dressing or transferring out of a wheelchair or getting help with a bath, those kinds of activities, those direct workers who are doing that kind of work are doing it in our homes. They're doing it in long-term care facilities, including skilled nursing facilities, and they're doing it in what's sometimes called residential care, which in Georgia, could be an assisted living setting, a personal care home, a community living arrangement for individuals with disabilities. There's a variety of settings. And so who those people are, what qualifications they have to have, how they're funded, 
that actually looks different in those other micro ecosystems um, as well. So I know we'll get into that, but I just wanted to kind of lay the land a little bit that even though we're sort of talking health, we're actually talking long-term services and supports with this population of caregivers that we're focused on today, which as you said, are predominantly women and especially women of color, especially in this state where you know, two thirds of them are, are black women. Got it. Thank you for that, Becky. And mm -hmm. there, there was something very interesting that you said that um, I think has re very real ramifications for the real world. And, and that's this question of having components of the care system that are not called health care. <laughs> Maybe we call them social service or, or, or something else, uh -huh. uh, specific, specifically around perhaps individuals that assist others with daily activities, daily living right. activities. And I just wanted to really raise this question, not just for you, but for others on the panel, is what is labeling certain aspects of care as not health care, labeling something else like a social service? What does it mean for the resources that get allocated to it? and the pay of workers within it? Well, a lot of it comes down to, you know, follow the money, right? And you follow the money to who's paying, which is the insurers. So either it's private health care insurance, right? Through your employer or through your uh, marketplace um, for an individual plan, or it's publicly funded healthcare through Medicare or Medicaid for low income individuals. There's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit on the side there, the veterans benefits and um, some other benefits, but the big ones are Medicare, Medicaid and private health insurance. And Medicare and private health insurance don't pay for long-term supports and services. So in fact, let me just repeat that because the vast majority of Americans think that Medicare is going to cover their long-term services and supports. All it covers is the very short window of time after a hospital stay for therapy and other skilled services. And it can do that either through certified home health care or through skilled nursing in a nursing facility, but that's very short term. And other than that, it doesn't pay for long-term services and supports. Most people who need long-term services and supports need them for a long time, ongoing, possibly the rest of their lives, depending on their chronic condition and depending on their disability. And so that is not healthcare for insurance purposes. The thing that makes a difference is Medicaid and increasingly a little bit of the Medicare Advantage programs are, are covering some of those social determinants of health. Medicaid being the biggest payer of that, over 40%, is a poverty program. That means it doesn't pay enough to providers in most cases which is gonna trickle down to the workers, right? If the provider's not getting paid enough, the workers are gonna not get paid enough. And as a participant in Medicaid, you have to either be poor or spend down your assets to a level where you are poor. And there are consequences for the state coming back after your death and taking money from your estate. So it's a poverty program. It's not what we wanna build a system on. Wow, thank you for that. It's very okay. eye-opening just to see how the system is funded because you're right, ultimately that matters for how workers are then funded. Right. Um, Natasha, I, I just wanted to pivot a little bit to some of the work that you do at Georgia Watch and, and to kind of take another angle on this question. Um, knowing the work that you do with community health workers and the work that you do to ensure that communities have access to the caregiving that they need. Can you tell us a little bit about what you are seeing among care workers right now? Absolutely. Um, and thank you, David, um, for allowing uh, me to participate on this panel. Um, and to inform those on the call who 
may not be aware of what a community health worker or a CHW is, CHWs are known as the bridge in between the medical environment, social services, and the community. Um, they work to reduce gaps in healthcare delivery services. Um, they help patients or clients successfully connect with the resources social workers might provide. They generally spend more time with clients um, than other healthcare providers because they are right there in the community. Um, they also can report signs and symptoms of health conditions for which they are trained. So CHWs advocate for underserved individuals um, in the community to ensure that they're receiving services and resources to address health needs. Um, and then they relay information and data to stakeholders to inform programs and policies. So to answer your question about what I've seen among CHWs is that they're struggling to find resources to help them provide care within their communities. I've heard some asking for better access to mental health services, um, a wider selection of healthcare services and pharmacies, especially in rural Georgia. Um, they're seeing patients go without medications because they either can't afford them or they don't have transportation to get to pharmacies where medications may cost a little less. They're seeing community members who are in desperate need of mental health services and know where to send them for care. Um, I've also heard from community health workers uh, in South Georgia who've had problems finding transportation for their community members to get them to the doctor's office or urgent care. Um, some have volunteered to take clients who are unable to drive to get COVID vaccines um, because they're out of range for transportation services. So I know of one who traveled three hours away from her home um, to get someone to take them to get a COVID vaccine. So in the midst of what community health workers are doing on a daily basis, we get hit with this devastating pandemic. And now they're not only trying to make sure that their communities are taken care of, but now they have to make sure that they're not exposing themselves and their families to the virus. So some have children that have had to attend school virtually, which has led to unexpected childcare costs. Um, some have lost family members to the virus and still had to push through that heartbreak to continue serving in their communities. So there's a lot of stress on community health workers right now, um, and many of those in the healthcare field. And thinking about the theme of, uh, this conference, um, when you take these things that are going on and compound them with the pre-existing systemic barriers and racial inequities that are unique to women of color, you get this intersectionality of circumstances that affect their overall outlook and ability to effectively cope and maintain their quality of life. Um, this isn't to say that they're not effective at doing their jobs, but it just speaks to how much they're getting accomplished in spite of their circumstances and also how much more they, they could accomplish um, with better resources and recognition. So um, overall, David, CHWs are doing everything they can with what they have to ensure communities have access to the caregiving they need, but it is important that we as a state provide them with the proper support uh, to continue their great work. Thank you for that. And, and this is a story that we've heard repeatedly, not just with CHWs, but also for state employees, for example, right. who are working at the local level, ensuring that uh, individuals have access to the social safety net if that's necessary, whereas they themselves are often on the same program right. that they are communicating with constituents about. So unfortunately, I don't know that we as a system do a very good job across the state of taking care of those who take care of others. So I wish I could you know, relay that this is a surprise, and, and but it, it is a systemic pattern um, that we have had repeatedly. So kind of, uh, Natasha, one other question for you as we sort of, uh, let's let's go a little deeper into the theme as we talk about the caregivers and now really thinking about the community to whom they give care. Mm -hmm. uh, are you able to say that our communities are getting the care that they need? And then I've got a couple of follow-up questions for that. Um, from what I've been hearing from community health workers and from our partners who work in this space, um, there are still many communities across the state that have large disparities in receiving the care that they need. Um, communities of color 
in particular, both rural and urban, um, are plagued by preventable morbidities um, from chronic diseases, asthma, heart disease, hypertension. Um, I was on a webinar this morning uh, given by the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative uh, for Economic and Social Justice and Human Rights Watch, and they released the report on cervical cancer deaths in rural Georgia and its disproportionate effect on Black women. Um, and largely the contributors to the poor outcomes for these health issues are non-medical. They include social determinants of health, as Becky mentioned, um, like just access to care, transportation, um, and adequate housing, health literacy. So you have a lot of communities that either don't have a doctor within 30 minutes of their home um, that are just struggling to, to find out what they're supposed to do in regards to their health. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think they're receiving the care that they need, um, especially in underserved communities uh, and solely just because of the social determinants of health that they're experiencing. Got it. No, that's very helpful. I know there's a systemic and sort of a package of factors that come together uh, to, in, to either help them receive care or that are inhibitors to receiving that care. And, and, I, and I don't know if this is a question that you can answer. I, I put it open to everyone on the panel. Uh, okay, so the answer is no. There are, our communities are not getting the care they need. And I think a follow-up is what would it take to help ensure that our communities that are, are getting the care that they need? Um, in order for our communities to get the care they need, um, I th think barriers must be broken down, including um, making healthcare affordable, um, providing more access to resources, uh, supporting our caregiver and CHW networks um, to empower them to effectively provide care. I know one CHW who right before Christmas was given notice by her landlord that the home she was renting was being sold. So we're on a call with her literally days before the holiday and she's trying to find a place for her and her two children to live that she can afford on her income. And she's doing this while caring for her father who's ill, um, yet she's still passionate about providing care to those in her community and trying to make it all work. So I think, you know, that was heartbreaking to hear, um, knowing her personally, and then um, knowing that she's not receiving the support that she needs um, is just discouraging. However, um, I think we need to just focus on better supporting and providing for our caregivers, um, both financially and educationally, to create a system that will advance health equity for our underserved populations. Um, Recently, I was speaking at a civic advocacy training, um, and I heard that many health workers are afraid to approach their legislators about the needs of the community for fear of not being heard or not seeing any change happen. Um, so they're trying to teach their community members about effective advocacy and how to reach out to legislators to create change, uh, but are not confident that their concerns will be addressed. So I think it's important to not only educate caregivers and CHWs around how um, effective advocacy can bring about change, but also inform policymakers that their constituents want to feel heard and supported by those who represent them at the Capitol. And I think this is uh, most necessary for care workers and CHWs to be able to efficiently provide the care that their patients or clients need. No, thank you for that. That's an excellent answer. And it really helps us begin to get our arms around, you know, what are our next steps? What are the things that we can be actively leaning into and to be productive in, right. in the advocacy that we do? Uh, Shelly, um, there's such an important aspect of all of these conversations around caregiving, care receiving, um, how women of color experience that system. Uh, but one of the aspects that really we really wanted to uh, think through is how individuals with disabilities are also navigating this system, either as a caregiving recipient or as a caregiver themselves. And the first question I really had for you is how have individuals with disabilities been affected by the shifts within the caring ecosystem, especially during the pandemic? And this, and thank you so much, David, for the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, being a woman of color and also with a disability, a lot of things have come to light 
during this particular time, professionally and personally. And the pandemic really shed some light on how the system is almost set up to fail in some instances. Um, people with disabilities, unfortunately, are facing very trying times. And especially with those um, individuals who receive in-home care, uh, something that uh, my colleague Becky was referring to, uh, a system that allows individuals to come out and care for individuals within their home. And there are waiver programs. And I also happen to be a participant of the independent care waiver program, which allows somebody to come in and help in with my daily living activities you know, for me to get up and go to work. But when the pandemic hit, it really, again, shed a light on the system and the need for serious change. And what we were able to hear from various people is caregivers were not comfortable coming out to work, going into somebody's home uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, and also individuals didn't want care caregivers necessarily coming into their homes. And the reason that is, is because uh, the caregivers are underpaid and they're working two and three jobs just to make ends meet. So when you're in and out of individuals' homes, it's like, well, that's a little iffy. I don't know if I want to be around you when you're exposed to so many other people. So that has become one of the things now and those who were willing to come in to the home were basically eating up the allowable hours that they were able to work because they didn't have nobody else coming in. Most individuals will have at least two and sometimes three caregivers for the hours throughout the day uh, for them to basically make it uh, within their uh, quote unquote being independent. So that was some of the big things that uh, people with disabilities are facing. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's really interesting just how this system, uh, like you said, is set up to fail. You know, it, it maybe wasn't functioning optimally prior to the pandemic. And now we're in a situation where we put a bowling ball on a house of cards and we brought it down. Um, so I, I guess the the follow-up question is similar to the one that, that I had for Natasha is just from your perspective, uh, how, do, how do we make this better? How can we, let's, let's say, you know, a year from now, the pandemic has subsided to an extent. Um, how do we know, not go back? <laughs> how do we learn from what has occurred so that we can meet the next crisis, whether it's another public health emergency or or just uh, something else in our lives as a nation and as a state that we need to wrestle with? It's really interesting. And I almost see the current healthcare system and in particular with individuals with disabilities as the, the game, is it called Jenga? Where it may look, but you're pulling out, you know, key components from the center of it. And at some point it's gonna implode on itself. So it almost has to be, to me, just a complete overhaul of the system, um, especially for you know caregivers, as you mentioned before, the percentage of women of color who provide a service for people with, and I'm speaking on individuals with disabilities in particular, um, being able to support those who care for some of the most vulnerable people within our communities. And without them, it doesn't work. Um, you know, there's always a fear of institution or reinstitution for individuals who would like to remain independent as possible. They are now considering and working towards, uh, I believe it's called the family model or the family focused practice, which will allow caregivers or the individual to 
use a family member as a caregiver, uh, whereas before it was very challenging for something like that to happen because of uh, fraud, you know, suspected fraud of a family member actually caring for uh, one of their family members. They're like a parent caring for their adult disabled child or uh, a sibling doing something like that as well. But they're coming into it because right now we're also seeing that there is a shortage of caregivers. Nobody wants to work for minimum wage, uh, especially when they're providing such an important service. And I think we really need to uh, revamp and consider caregivers as essential. And they need to be paid accordingly. We need to be able, as Natasha was saying, being able to support our caregivers. And until that happens, um, it's gonna be very challenging to find qualified individuals where they don't have to meet or work several jobs in order for them to make it. And then to piggyback on what Natasha was saying, the legislature, they wanna hear from you. Um, summer is a great time to meet with people within their communities, with their legislature but also share these uh, personal stories because they're not gonna be able to do anything if they don't know anything about it. So uh, I think it's very important for people to be more uh, active in reaching out to their, their legislature. David, if it would be okay, I'd like to add on to something Shelley just said. Um, Shelley, you... Uh, talked a little bit about um, family members being paid as caregivers. Certainly there are many family members and friends that are unpaid caregivers. Um, but I did wanna uh, emphasize that we also um, at Atlanta Regional Commission experienced that same issue you just talked about with the shortage of availability of staff and paid caregivers. And so um, we used COVID funds, um, COVID grant funds to be able to establish a consumer direction program for people 60 plus where they can hire family members or friends to be their caregiver. Um, and we also started, uh, this flexibility I think is critical, especially when there's shortages of staffing. And um, this, the other thing we started was a voucher program for respite for caregivers so that respite, so that caregivers who need a break can have um, a voucher to pay for someone to come into the home or to be able to have an adult day service so someone can leave the home, depending on what model fits better for that individual. But that flexibility has been really, really important um, during COVID especially. Um, the other thing I would say to David's question about what fixes it, um, those are some pieces, some tweaks, right? But to me, fundamentally what fixes it is on the long-term services and support side, I'm talking now specifically, what fixes it is having a national long-term care insurance. Right now, less than 10% of long-term care is paid by private long-term care insurance. That market is weak. That market has never paid very much in, in our ecosystem. And so we've got to figure out a way to have a better way to pay for long-term care. It is the biggest uninsured risk that our population, that any individual in our population faces. So it's really an important risk to be taking a look at. The financial underpinnings just aren't there right now. And then that has an impact on the direct care worker who doesn't get paid well, because the back like what we were saying before, if you're getting paid by a poverty program, you're not gonna be getting the kinds of workers' uh, benefits and salaries that are needed to keep a strong workforce. And in order for you to maintain good workers, they have to be compensated. Uh, so yeah, that fundamental plan would be, I mean, ideal because uh, the demographic is changing or has changed. People are living longer and they need or will be needing that particular service a lot of times sooner than later. So something to really consider. Oh, thank you. The, um, 
this this puts me in such a deep place this amazing conversation which we i wish we had these every day and i wish we had them with decision makers uh in the depth that we're allowed to do in this very intimate panel setting um, but some things have been resonating as each of you and your expertise have been commenting on the big picture uh, one of one of them is this question of invisibilization or silencing and this is something that came up during the opening panel where workers are just expected to show up no matter what is going on in their life and and in many cases because of the of the focus of this conference which is the caring ecosystem we're talking about women of color and of course on this panel we're also talking about individuals with disabilities and uh, because we have had this practice of you know during the pandemic we were very um clear but unfairly so these workers were always essential they didn't become more essential because of the pandemic they were always essential and i think more importantly they're people and they're living beings and they have families who love them and and, and they have rights so i think that aspect unfortunately gets missed missed in the in the conversation and becky i know on the front end we talked about the narrative and how the narrative gets built and if we call them care workers instead of health workers then maybe it's a different kind of conversation um, and where i'm going with this is we're now at about 235 and about 245 we wanted to transition to the q a um, but there's a very big statement that arose early in the prep for this panel and becky i think it was you that shared it and i actually want to open it up for all of you to respond to and i apologize to those in virtual world this is a little bit of a long statement, but it, but for me, it encapsulated the core struggle that we're wrestling with on this call. And it really cuts to the heart of, do we see people as an end in and of themselves, or do we simply see them as a means to an end? And it's one of two ways. And whichever way we choose really determines everything else in terms of our investments from a public funding standpoint, um, how we support each other during times of crisis, like we're dealing with right now. And then really the big question of where do we go from here as a state? So if y'all will bear with me, I wanted to, you know, sort of um, bring up this question again, because it has become, uh, I think, so fundamental to everything else that we have wrestled with and where we were going. And, and uh, just to attribute proper citation and, and authorship to the person who wrote, wrote it is from Laura Malden, an author of The American Prospect. And here, here goes. Uh, and this is from an article called The Care Crisis Isn't What You Think. And Laura says, or rather Laura wrote, here's what we don't talk about when we talk about the care crisis. When it comes to disability, we devalue care, that is both caregiving and paid care work, because we devalue the people who need it. It's why we position care as a response to a horrible disaster. It's why we refuse to adequately fund home care and fairly pay care workers. It's why we rely on the 53 million and climbing unpaid family caregivers across the US to provide care for free. So I wanted to put this very big encapsulating sweeping statement to you today to answer at about 2.37 PM on January 20th here on this Zoom conversation, because I think it strikes at the very heart of our discussion. So I'm going to open the floor to each of you and just I'll allow you to respond from your perspective. Um, I'll, I'll jump in there first. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think that the statement is very true. Um, the, the caregivers, care workers, the people they care for are extremely undervalued. Um, and it's important to highlight this issue. I, I myself have been a caregiver, an unpaid caregiver, um, and trying to juggle that with getting to work and having to miss work, you know, on, on days of crisis is, is very taxing. Um, and it's a hard uh, load to carry, especially in the midst of the pandemic, um, when you're having to uh, try to adjust to all the changes that have been made within the pandemic. And now 
working from home and then still trying to provide care and avoid burnout, I think it's uh, very important um, to make sure that caregivers feel valued. Um, and uh, something we know to be true when it comes to advocacy um, is that their power in numbers. So imagine if those 53 million unpaid caregivers came together to emphasize uh, how important it is to be recognized for the care that they provide um, and to help lift up the voices of those that they provide care for, I think that we would begin to see some real policy change in the caregiving space. Um, and particularly like Becky mentioned, uh, national long-term care insurance. If 53 million people came to the table to advocate for that, I think there would be a, a good conversation started up um, on the national level. So um, my comment to that is just, it, it's so important to uh, be heard, to advocate for the change that you want to see uh, in the caregiving workspace um, and be relentless in your uh, efforts to, to make those changes. So I will add, uh, go ahead, Shelley. No, go ahead. Um, I'll add that um, to what Natasha said, I would, I would add that um, we have endemic in our culture, ageism and ableism. Layered on top of that, racism and, um, and discrimination against women. I mean, think of how many boxes this statement checks, right? I mean, older people, older people with disabilities, younger people with disabilities, women who are providing the service, women of color who are providing the service. I mean, these are things that we as a country have not dealt with well. We have not valued these various sectors uh, in the same way that we have other sectors, right? Um, the other piece of it that I think is absolutely critical to think about is the caregivers, whether unpaid or paid, don't always think of themselves, especially the unpaid, don't always think of themselves as caregivers. We don't identify, oh, I'm actually helping my mom. Well, maybe she lives in a different town, but I'm helping her with her finances and helping her figure out how to make everything work in her life right now because she's not able to do everything because maybe she has dementia, maybe she has some other chronic illness. I'm doing a lot of that. I don't see myself as a caregiver. I see myself as a daughter. But the fact is a lot of us are doing this work and we're not understanding the toll it takes on us and aren't getting the supports we need to do it well. And, and the supports aren't there for the paid enough or the unpaid because we haven't valued it as a nation. Well, I, I check all of Becky's uh, boxes. <laughs> I'm a middle-aged woman of color with a disability. And so I know what it feels like to be invisible. And the challenges that people with disabilities have been fighting for, for over 30 years, uh, when, you know, before the ADA was even implemented, uh, and the struggle and the civil rights, uh, the civil protests and the, uh, the civil unrest that people with disabilities have had to, to go through in order for them to be some basic laws in place. And so if you're, if I consider my, well, I used to, you know, consider myself to be invincible because I didn't feel as I was being heard about the things that I needed just to have a little uh, equity in this world. And I get up and go to work every day. But if some of these resources in, uh, are not in place, then none of that exists. And just like everybody needs a hand here and there, that's the same thing. But I'm also very concerned about those who provide a service to me. And it makes a huge difference. I have typically have had women of color provide my care. Uh, lately, I, I actually probably one of the few who have men providing my care. And it's not that I'm disregarding the women, but it's just that I where my disability has progressed, that I need a man's strength 
a daily strength to, to provide my care. So recruiting, letting them know that they are valued. And that I think is key. And you, these women definitely have a passion for what they do. Otherwise, who would want to stay in a job that's low paying? Uh, you have to have two or three of them to make it. So um, it's just really interesting. The statement is true. Uh, I feel it professionally and personally. Um, and so, but yeah, devaluing it, finding that healthcare that will keep us in a position to where we're not only healthy physically and mentally. And my voice is about to go, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, again, I, I wish we had these opportunities at a, at a bigger level to sort of have conversations. Um, and, you know, one thing that I think that emerges through this kinds of through this kind of dialogue and this kind of conference and and certainly with all the great partners that you all work with and, and the partners that you are is the heroes. <laughs> They're there all the time. And they keep the world going and they keep people alive. In many cases, they are the, uh, the difference between life and death. And it, in, many, in many ways, I think we have a system that does not facilitate conversation. It certainly does not facilitate communication with the heroes. Um, but then at the same time, I think there's a lot of work that we can do around collective identity. And, and Becky, like you said, what, People don't wake up thinking that they're a caregiver. They just do it. And it needed to be done because it was in front of them at the time. Or, um, you know, a loving heart doesn't pause. It just moves. It, it runs towards rescue. In many cases, it runs towards danger. Um, but the danger is often a quiet danger. And it's often, in many cases, I think... Um, the obstacles that no one else would see. And, and, you know, before the ADA came into existence, a doorway, a staircase. And in many cases, we still don't have what we need to provide individuals with disabilities with access. But that was not seen. And I think if you look at the herky-jerky advances that we have had in this space historically, it shouldn't take so much <laughs> to do basic things to appreciate individuals for who they are. Um, so we have actually uh, hit our uh, 256 mark, which gives us about 14 minutes uh, for a Q&A from the audience. And I wanna certainly open that up uh, to allow audience members to uh, ask you questions and to really uh, help them and help us all understand a little bit more about who you are, what you do and why you do it. So um, I wanna open that up at this time. and and kind of go from there. So if you all can can bear with me a minute, we'll let some of those roll in. So we're, uh, sort of walking out a couple of technical issues, um, but we can certainly sort of raise a couple of questions that we may not have thought about. And, and one that I wanted to put back out since we've had so many conversations around the question of collective identity, uh, and this is one for any of you to sort of answer, and that is how are we coming on formation of collective identity among workers in the spaces that you work? Uh, how are we doing with organizing? And what are sort of the necessary and sufficient conditions to get that collective identity and those organizing steps underway? I'm so sorry, David. Can you repeat that one more time, please? Yeah, and I'll shorten it. I, I sometimes <laughs> forget to have a period in my <laughs> questions. But I, I think, Shelley, the, the first part is how are we coming on forming collective identity? among individuals in the spaces that we work in. Good question. And I don't know if I would be able to really answer that. I think that 
um, and maybe from my perspective, is that a lot of things, although we knew about them, we just did not really know how deep the problem really was until the pandemic actually happened. I think um, working with the community that I work with, individuals with disabilities, we've always known that it's there. And trying to change that narrative uh, has been challenging. Again, we've been working with this for years, long before I even you know, came in, onto the scene and, and acquired my disability. But it's a constant educational process uh, trying to let people know, you know, your how your value then. This is how you should see yourself. And it's hard with that mindset. And I think, and in particular with women of color, that's just something that we did. You know, you take care, you know, your parents and your, your nana and, and papa and everybody. That's just what you do. And trying to change that narrative uh, and definitely needs to be a consistent, uh, ongoing conversation with individuals. So we try to do what we can to let people know who they are uh, or how we see them and how they should see themselves. So uh, we appreciate that. And we do our best to try to advocate on their behalf, uh, especially during session. And even when we do our summer visits, we always try to make this a, a no fact. But I think that value we have to instill into the actual caregiver. How that happens, again, just repeated conversations. I think, um, David, your comment earlier about um, the heart that moves forward um, is uh, maybe both the blessing and the curse of this work because um, individuals who are who are caregivers, whether paid or unpaid, so many of them are doing it from their heart and they see it as their individual mission. And they and I think it's sometimes difficult for people to see themselves as part of a collective and to see themselves as um, that th the solutions to some of the challenges actually might be social or policy not their individual family situation or their individual work situation. I think this kind of work, particularly when you're talking about work at the, in the in-home setting, can be very isolating. And you don't realize that there are not only hundreds or thousands, but millions of people facing exactly the same challenge as you as a caregiver are facing, but you're not connected. So I think you asked a really good question. I don't think we have the silver bullet for the answer, but I think it's that individual heart that sometimes also blinds us to the fact that, oh, maybe it's the system that's the problem. Not that I don't, I don't care enough. No, thank you for those great answers. Um, yes, I, you were echoing, I think we're all on the same wavelength today, Becky, you were echoing the, the question of isolation. It's very, it's very big. And, you know, if you, t if you talk that, you know, a lot of caregivers have sort of a 300 square foot radius that they work within and, you know, you, you go to the kitchen and, and you get what is needed there or you help the individual uh, do what they need to do in terms of using the facilities, whatever those may be. And you can, you can pass hours in your day doing that. Um, and I, I definitely have seen it within my own family, you know, individuals caring for someone who has maybe got advancing dementia, and you answer the same question, you know, within a five minute span, and, and that can also have an effect, I think, on the mental health of caregivers, and that's something also that is not talked about is, is um, it's, it's isolating and isolation is, is not good for your mental health, and, you know, you're trying to get the basic things done, much less go to make policy change happen or to have that interaction with a state senator or rep that you need to do to make the system better. So it, it's, a, it's a very vicious cycle potentially. And COVID has really 
put a spotlight on that issue. Um, the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving did a study of caregivers and the stress levels that are happening for, this is unpaid family caregivers that I'm talking about now. And those unpaid family caregivers said that because of COVID, 83% of them said because of COVID, their stress levels are significantly higher. So, so COVID really has shown a light on what was already stressful and, and you know, it's, it's made it that much worse in terms of the isolation, in terms of the concerns about health and safety and finances. Absolutely. Now, this is a, a, a great conversation. And, and I want to bend back a little bit to one that we had early on. And, and Shelly, you, you came into the conversation a little bit too. Um, and this is the question of how we pay for this and, and how we can think about other methods of getting workers to the wages that they need in order, uh, like all of you have said, they're working three jobs and, and they themselves are facing some fairly significant challenges. Um, but, you know, what funds are available? And I think, Becky, you brought up some of them, but what are the creative options that we could think through as well? Um, you know, maybe other states have some examples that we might want to look at and have done a better job. So I just wanted to put that out there since so much of this is about resources and, and paying people for their time. I think funding is always uh, going to be at the top of the page. Um, and I believe as much as money is being spent, a lot more can go into the various programs. And it's actually cheaper to have somebody remain in their home instead of being in an institution. So even if some of that funding is redirected or repurposed to provide better uh, community uh, in-home or home-based community services, uh, I think that's perhaps one option. Um, as a nonprofit receiving federal funding, I can't go in and lobby for anything like that, but I will try my best to educate and potentially ask you know, or present my argument in a way that they would ask, what can we potentially do? But again, I think some of that money should be redirected in order to provide better uh, income levels for these individuals. Uh, what I think also will probably end up happening is that some of these smaller providers will probably eventually implode or no longer exist because they have a hard time recruiting individuals, especially at low pay. Uh, there is self-directed options uh, that will cut out the middleman so you can pay your caregiver at a higher level, but at the same time, you still have to go out and do your own recruiting. So there's, you know, six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. But what we do know is that people when they are in their own homes, they're healthier, they're happier, they're less likely to go into a, a hospital setting. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the caregivers, the care workers are taken care of. And perhaps, again, repurposing, redirecting some of that money that will go into an institution should come into um, the public sector. Got it. Thank you for that. And we're running really tight on time. So there's one more question from uh, the audience that I wanted to share with you. It's a very simple one, uh, but a great one. Is there a labor union that represents community health care workers, either at the state or the national level? Yeah, so there is, um, it's not a labor union, but it's an advocacy group. There's, uh, it's called NASHWA. It's the National Association of Community Health Workers. Um, and they help advocate on a national level. Um, and then here in the state of Georgia, um, we have the Community Health Worker Advocacy, Advocacy Coalition. Um, there's also the um, Southwest uh, Georgia Community Health Worker Advocacy Group. So there are quite a few uh, CHW advocacy groups across the state um, that are 
actively talking about these issues. I'm so glad uh, Becky um, and Shelly both brought up the mental health aspect um, that is hitting caregivers and care workers so hard in the midst of this pandemic. Um, and also uh, how ARC is providing that respite uh, voucher. It's huge um, for people that are um, in homes uh, providing care um, on a consistent basis. So the community health worker coalitions that I've mentioned, and there are many more, um, actively uh, meet monthly, actively talk about these issues, and actively um, try to organize to advocate for both funding and uh, better resources. Oh, that's great, and and thank you so much. This this actually uh, concludes our panel. And Natasha, Shelley, Becky, I just wanted to say thank you so much for attending with us. Um, I will let everyone know out there in the virtual world that we will be having a healthcare networking by issue area at 4:15. Um, but before then, we're about to take a short break. And um, I inv invite everybody to come back at 315. We have our keynote panel and it's called Building an Equitable Care System that Sustains and Heals. So all of you out there, don't you go nowhere. <laughs> We're gonna be right back, but please rejoin us at 315 for that keynote panel. And I imagine there, y'all, there's a massive applause that's probably happening at the moment, but since we're in this virtual setting, um, I hope you will hear that in your head. We would be doing a wave for all of you. Thank you so much for these great comments. And uh, we will, you know, of course, keep trying to move the ball and, and to make things better. But I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much, David. You're Thank welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you.